morning again, everyone. Morning. You're very welcome to Shadow Christian Fellowship. Welcome to those on Facebook and on YouTube watching in this morning. You're also very, very welcome. I'm just going to pray for God's word before we begin. Father, we just want also, Lord, to remember Sandra, who has COVID at this time, and, and ask, Father, that, that you would be with her and grant her full recovery, Lord, please. And Lord, as we turn now to your word, we pray that your word would do its work. That people would leave here, Lord, with the word of God in their hearts, not the words of Tommy Gordon. That people watching on Facebook or on YouTube would hear what God is saying to them. That we would all hear what you're saying. Because you're God who is always speaking. The problem is, Father, your word tells us that we choose, we willingly choose to exchange the truth of you and your truth for lies, our own lies. Help us, Lord, please, to set aside our lives, to set aside our preconceived ideas of you, and to listen to your word this morning. Holy Spirit of God, speak to us all, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, if you remember, I always think when I'm doing this, because I speak the last Sunday, then I speak the introduction again for the Wednesday Night Bible, so they maybe come back this week, and you're speaking the introduction again. Um, I think, my goodness, I have this embedded in my mind now. But last week I spoke about the guy called Charles Blondin. And Charles Blondin was the, uh, the French tightrope walker. And he was famous for walking across Niagara Gorge or Niagara Falls. And basically it's 1,100 feet wide and it was 160 feet drop. And he walked along the, on this tightrope. In fact, he did it on stilts. He did it in a sack. He took a chair, put one leg of the chair on the, the tightrope, and he sat on it reading a paper. He did it blindfolded, and all the people on both sides, they were shouting and cheering and saying, you're the greatest, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. So then Blondin produced a wheelbarrow, and he said to them, do you believe that I could take this barrel across? And they went, yes, 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 you're the greatest, you're the greatest. And he said, well, if any of you truly believe that I can do it, Get in the barrel. Not a single person, <laughs> rightly so, not a single person got into the barrel. You see, they all were able to say, you're the greatest, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. We believe that you can do it. They witnessed him going back and forward numerous occasions. But when it really came to it, and he said, get in the barrel, no one did. And the point is, it's easy to say that we believe in something or in someone. But it's a very different matter when it comes to proving it. You know, in the church and in the world, many people say they believe in Jesus. That's very nice. Many people say they believe in God. But they can't actually prove it. I told a story years ago about a few of my mates were all around the house and we were all trying to justify ourselves as these great Christian people and how we could prove. And so the, the, the thing was a very famous line. If it, if it became against the law to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to put you in jail? Mm. And so we were all arguing with each other, was there enough evidence? And we couldn't find it. And then my brother Joe came walking into the house at the time and I said, and here is my salvation. Now he'll answer. So I said, Joe, is there enough proof that I'm a born again Christian? And he went, yeah, yeah, you've got Christian books. <laughs> Salvation. 
when it's not enough. That is not enough for somebody. Saying you believe in God, saying that you believe in Jesus, will never get anyone into heaven. It's not enough. You can call yourself whatever you like. You can declare that you believe whatever you want. But when it comes to proving it, it's a very different matter. And if your life doesn't prove that you've experienced the work of the Holy Spirit in conversion, you, the Bible says, you remain dead in trespasses and sins. In fact, the Apostle Paul describes you as having no hope and without God in the world. See, it doesn't matter how much money you've got. It doesn't matter how well off you are in life. It doesn't matter if everything seems to be going so wonderful in your life. If you have not experienced Holy Spirit conversion, you are dead to God, you are dead to the things of God, and you are described as having no hope and without God in the world. If there is no Holy Spirit conversion in your life, there is absolutely no salvation. So we're reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul writes these words. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep or, or died. Verse 7. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore whether it was I or they so we preach. And so you believed. And one verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, very famous verse, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Very often we read the Bible and we just read over it and we don't really take the time to ask questions. What does he actually mean when he says certain things? And I think it's a good thing to do is take your time. It's not a race to get through the Bible, but take your time and at times pray it back to God and say, what's he talking about or what does this mean? But let me explain. When Paul speaks of himself and the Christians in Corinth having received, he read it there, having received the gospel, what he actually means is this. The gospel which we heard, the gospel which we took hold of, and the gospel which we made a part of us. Now here's the problem that we have. A lot of people hear the gospel. We have people shouting the gospel in the streets. We have people shouting the gospel you know, on, on bangers, uh, seafront in the summertime. We have people shouting, and I have no issue with people shouting the gospel. And a lot of people hear the gospel, but they don't take it to the next stage, which is to take a hold of the gospel. And then there is the third stage where they make it a part of them. So a lot of people hear the gospel. A lot of people actually can also take a hold of it and say, oh, that was not a really good message that he spoke today. Maybe think about it and take a hold of it. It's a bit like the parable of the sower where Jesus talked about the seed being sown. And some, you know, fell, among the, the, fell on the rocks and on the hard ground and the birds came and take it. So that's the ones we hear, but it just gets taken away very quickly. And then others fell in among uh, the thorns and hard ground. Or whatever. The only one that mattered was the one that fell on soil that was prepared. And a lot of people will hear the gospel and it's just taken away like that. A lot of people will hear it and maybe take it on board for a short time and take a hold of it and then they'll just fall away and that's not for me. But those who make it a part of them are those who are genuinely saved. 
And so our focus is the work of the Holy Spirit in the conversion of the sinner. Now, I want you to hear this this morning. The work of the Holy Spirit in the conversion of the sinner. So please note, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to convert people, not anyone else. In this country, we have this awful, awful belief that it's our job to convert people. It is not the job of a Christian to convert anyone. Christians should never, please hear this, Christians should never badger, cajole, manipulate, or harass people into becoming a Christian. They shouldn't be using persuasive words, you know, like, oh, it's a much better life, or you know it makes sense, like Del Boy Trotter. You know, you're, we're not supposed to be doing stuff like that. And why? Because it can mislead people to believe that they have become a Christian when in fact the Holy Spirit has not converted them. And here's the problem with the Judas deception that I was speaking about last week. The churches in Northern Ireland, and I can't speak for other places, but the churches in Northern Ireland are filled with people who are under the Judas deception. They believe that because they go to church, they believe that because they do certain things or that someone got them to say the wee sinner's prayer, they believe they're saved. They go to church Regularly, they pay in the church regularly. They do all of these nice religious things, but those things do not and cannot save anyone. You have to undergo conversion, which is a work of the Holy Spirit. You know, a drunk came up one night to see it. Spurgeon, the famous preacher, I've said this story many times. As a drunk came up to Spurgeon in the street and burped in Spurgeon's face and said, Here are you. I'm one of your converts, to which Spurgeon replied, I can tell, because you're certainly not one of the Holy Spirits. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the problem, as I said, the church is rife. Please hear this. The church is rife. It is packed with man-made converts who foolishly believe that they are Christians. Christians are not called to make converts. Christians are called to make disciples, and there's a difference. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to convert sinners, without which no one, I don't care how religious you are, I don't care how often you pray, how much you give in the church, without the Holy Spirit converting you, no one, no one can be saved. Well, I was reading during the week um, about psychology, and that's, that's the study of the mind and, and how it functions. And the will to live. Do you know when people talk about the will to live? Oh, he's lost the will to live and all of this stuff. Well, the will to live in psychology is described as the drive for self-preservation. And it's usually coupled with expectations for future improvement in one state in life. So listen to it again because it's dead simple when I break it down into English. Okay. The will to live in psychology is described as the drive for self-preservation, usually coupled with expectation for future improvement in one state in life. In other words, people aim to live. People aim even to survive in the hope that things will improve. And it reminded me of the 1993 uh, D. Ream song. Remember, things can only get better than that liar Tony Blair used it as his, his, his election campaign. <laughs> things can only get better. I don't think so, Tony. You made things so much worse. But look at the state of our world. So you can almost hear D. Ream singing here, you know, things can only get better, things can only get better. Look at the state of our world. Do you seriously think that things can only get better? Take COVID-19 and the pandemic at this present time. Over 5.6 million people worldwide so far have allegedly died from COVID-19. Think of all of the associated illnesses and the people who have died who haven't been able to get hospital care or whatever because the, the, the hospitals are overwhelmed by COVID-19. Think of all of the lies and the deceit and the conspiracies around COVID-19. Think of Russia, for example. Russia at the moment, look at the antics of them, right on the border with Ukraine, could potentially spark a war in Europe. Look at the ongoing wars in Yemen and different parts of the world. Look at the conflicts that are happening in different countries. Look at terrorism 
in the, in the world. Think about climate change, environmental disasters, poverty, pollution, malnourishment, deforestation and disease. I mean, the list is absolutely endless. In light of that, do you seriously think that things can only get better? Is that what you're living for? Are you living in the hope that things can only get better as far as this world is concerned? Well, of course, things may get better for an individual or in an, indi in an individual's life, but is that all you're living for? You know, some might say this morning, for crying out loud, Tally, I, I thought going to church was about good news. <laughs> and you're hitting us with all of this unpleasantness and doom and gloom and whatever else. But, you know, you're right. We're partly called as a church to proclaim the good news. It's not just the only thing, but the church exists to proclaim God's good news. And God's good news is this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So do you understand, everybody in the world is a sinner and Christ had to come into the world to save sinners. But it does not say that Christ Jesus came into the world to make things better. It doesn't say that Christ Jesus came into the world to make our lives so much improved. Christ Jesus, good news, God's good news, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And today, this is the same good news that Paul and the Corinthians heard, took hold of, and made a part of them. That Jesus loves you. That Jesus died to rescue you from sin, sin, death, and hell. Jesus came into the world and died to give you something worth living for. To bring you back into a right relationship with God the Father that you might receive forgiveness of sins, adoption into God's family, and to have everlasting life. Whatever is going on in the world, and let me be clear, so that, you know, I don't want to leave you here with doom and gloom, but let's tell the truth. Whatever is going on in this world, things are not going to get better. You may be fooled into thinking things are going to get better, but they're not. So whatever's going on in the world, the good news about Jesus, pardon me, the good news about Jesus, I can't even find where I am one of those. <laughs> That's how much it's good news. <laughs> the good news about Jesus and that Jesus gives those who take a hold of, who hear take hold of and make part of them, this, this good news, this gospel of Jesus, it gives people this. A new will to live. Do you understand? Now to the front where I am. Whatever's going on in our world, things aren't going to get better. But the good news about Jesus is that it gives those who hear it, who take hold of it, and make it a part of them, it gives them a new will to live in our world of need and of suffering as we wait for the better world to come. Because ladies and gentlemen, there is a better world to come, but you can only get there through faith in Jesus. But this new will to live, this wonderful will to live, and it's only given by the Holy Spirit. It isn't about like psychology, it's not about self-preservation, it's about self-denial. As we hope for, as the Bible says, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ coming to take us to that better place and trust me it's going to happen if someone asks me on a personal level on a personal level I'm not telling you it's what the Bible says on a personal level do I believe that Jesus Christ will come back soon the answer is yes I do do I believe he's likely to come back in my lifetime yes I do so if you're not ready and that event happens you will be lost for all eternity but this new will to live, given by the Holy Spirit, it's not about self-preservation, but about self-denial, waiting for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's coming to take us to a better place. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You hear that? 
You hear what Jesus is saying? It's not like the world. The world is all about self-preservation and gathering around you as much as you can. Jesus says the opposite. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. The Christian's new will to live is a direct outcome of the Holy Spirit in conversion in that person's life. And it includes a denial of our former sinful ways and a desire to live for God's glory. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If anyone, this is the wonderful thing about the good news of Jesus. It means anyone. That means it doesn't matter how wicked you have been. It means it doesn't matter how sinful you think you are. It doesn't matter if you think there is no forgiveness for you. It doesn't matter if you think there's no way on this planet that God could ever forget, forgive the terrible things that I have done. The Bible is clear. If anyone, anyone is in Christ, anyone becomes a Christian, he is a new creation all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now let me just remind ourselves, and I love this because when you read in the Old Testament, you see time and time again the people of Israel being reminded about their history and being down in Egypt and being delivered out of Egypt. And there's a, a lesson in that where we repeat the same things over and over. That's why they used to sing the song, Tell Me the Old, Old Story of Unseen Things Above, because we repeat the truth. So let me remind ourselves what God's word teaches. When God created man in his image, it was for his glory and for man to enjoy a relationship with God. He was created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. However, because of Eve and Adam's disobedience, sin entered all mankind and marred God's image in every one of us, causing spiritual death. We died to God spiritually. And sin still separates people from God. Mankind's rebellious disobedience also initiated physical death. It was never God's intent that man would die. But because of sin and because of rebelliousness, we died to God spiritually and we go through the process of aging and dying. That was never God's intention. Sin so mars God's image in us it prevents any one of us from glorifying God by anything that we can do. Do you hear what that's saying to you this morning? There is absolutely nothing, nothing whatsoever on planet Earth that you can do to make God show you favor. There is nothing whatsoever that you can do. It doesn't matter how religious you think you are. There is nothing that you can do, nothing whatsoever that will allow you to have favor with God. You cannot glorify God by self-effort. No one can be saved by doing good. And I don't care how much good you think you're doing if you think you're doing it towards salvation. Doing good's nice, but don't do good in the hope that you might be saved. No one can be saved by doing good. No one can be saved by cleaning up their act and starting going to church. Jesus said, no one, no one is good except God. Well, some people might say, and I've heard it many times, well, you know, I'm a good person. I, I don't do anything wrong. I'm not like her. I'm not like him. I'm a good person. I'm, you know, I'm a good Christian with a small C. I go to my church. I say my prayers. I get involved with my indulgences and my sacraments. I do all of the religious things. And others might say, oh, but Tony, hold on. Surely I'm going to heaven because I believed in God since I was a child. I believe in Jesus. I believe in heaven and hell. Well, it's not enough. This is what the Bible teaches. That is not enough. These things can't save anyone. And therefore, death and hell awaits us all. And this is why mankind desperately needs the life-giving work of the Holy Spirit of God to enable us to hear the gospel, to take a hold of the gospel, and to make the gospel a part of us. The Holy Spirit alone converts a person. The Holy Spirit alone causes a person to be spiritually born again. And he enables us to live as God first intended 
to glorify God and to enjoy our relationship with him. Who here this morning, who here enjoys their relationship with God? I'm glad the Christians <laughs> are putting their hand up when there's something wrong. But that's the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who has worked in your life to bring you into a relationship with God where you can enjoy him. And that is what God intended. And there is a day fixed when Jesus shall return to gather all of those people back to himself. And so we shall be forever with the Lord, enjoying him for eternity. Without the work of the Holy Spirit in conversion, no one, absolutely no one, can glorify God. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't make a blind bit of difference. You cannot glorify God in any way by any form of self-effort. If you only possess a worldly, psychological will to live, if you've only got that drive for self-preservation, usually coupled with expectation for future improvement in your state of life, if you only live to survive, if you only live in the hope that things will improve, that things will get better, well then you have got life very, very badly wrong. Do you hear that? If that is your drive, you've got life very badly wrong. Even if things get better for you, temporally, you know, in, in this life only, in this time only, if things get better for you, but you have never experienced Holy Spirit conversion, and the will to live that he gives. Not of self-preservation, but of self-denial, taking up your cross and following Jesus. Then you need to take heed of what Jesus said, because this is what Jesus said. Even if things get better, Jesus said, what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit a person if they inherit the whole world but lose their soul? What shall it profit a man if he inherits the whole world but loses his soul. You know, calling yourself a Christian with a small c but living as you please. Calling yourself a Christian with a small c because you were confirmed as a child, because you were baptized as an infant, because you go to church, because you pay in the church, because you do religious things. Saying you believe in God, saying you believe in Jesus, but continuing to live in rebellion against him, it won't save you. It is not enough. It falls short of the glory of God. If a sinner, a person, does not experience the work of the Holy Spirit in conversion, if they do not take, hear and take hold of and make the good news of Jesus a part of them with a new will to live for God's glory, they remain dead to God. And if they die in that state, they will forfeit their soul in hell. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what the Bible teaches. And so Christian, let me ask you this morning, can you wholeheartedly say that you have heard, you have taken a hold of, and you have made the good news of Jesus a part of you? Do you really have a new will to live for God's glory? Is your walk with God about self-preservation or self-denial? Denying your old sinful ways, taking up your cross and following Jesus. If so, well then all I can say is press on with Jesus, knowing this, that for you Christian, things can only get better. Mm -hmm. Things can only get better. But if not, and you're calling yourself a Christian, get sorted. Mm -hmm. Because you may indeed have come under the Judas deception. You're only acquainted with Jesus and the things of Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior, you are dead to God. You are dead to the things of God. And God's word describes you as being without hope in the world, without God. Get it sorted. <coughs> Maybe this morning there's someone here or someone watching it on Facebook or on YouTube and you're not yet a Christian. Well, let me just say to you, what's your life all about? What are you living for? Is it all about self-preservation, living, surviving, you know, 
Try doing your, your damnedest to make sure that life is so good for you. And you're hoping that things will get better. And what if they don't? What if after all of your striving and all of your hard work, what if life just doesn't get better? Well, what if it does? Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he inherits the whole world but loses his soul. I don't know what your hopes and your dreams are, what you aspire to in, in this life, what you're wanting out of this life. But Jesus is saying to you, listen, even if you get everything you want and much, much more, what does it profit you if you inherit the whole world but lose your soul? You need the Holy Spirit to convert you, to enable you to be born again, to be brought back into a right relationship with God. Without the Holy Spirit converting you, you will die in your sin and you will go to hell. But God's good news, in the world that we live in where things are not going to get better, God's good news is this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And it applies to you today. There is salvation for you today. If you will hear Take hold of and make the good news of Jesus a part of you. God loves you and sent Jesus to die to rescue you from Satan, sin, death and hell. And to bring you back into a right relationship with God the Father. To receive forgiveness for all of your sins and to have everlasting life. Well, to avail all of this, you must do what God's word says. You must confess your sin. That doesn't mean go and tell people your sin. It doesn't mean that. It means agree with God. God, you are right. I am a sinner and I need to be saved. You've got to confess your sin. You've got to repent. You've got to turn around and turn away from your former sinful ways and put your trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone to save you and seek with the power of the Holy Spirit to live the life that he calls you to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we want to thank you for the good news of Jesus. We know, Lord God, as your people, that things are not going to get better in this world. We can all hope, of course, we can all hope that things will get better, Lord, but we know that it's only temporal. We know, Lord, that there are terrible, terrible days ahead when the Antichrist and others will come and it will be awful on this earth. But Father, thank you that for those who know and love Jesus, for those who have heard the gospel, who have taken a hold of it and who have made it a part of them, that we have the absolute assurance that things will get better for us because one day soon, Jesus is coming to gather his people onto himself to take us to where he is, to where he dwells until all of the terrible things in this world are dealt with once and for all. Lord, will you help us please? to live our lives for the glory of God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, not through self-effort, but by the power of your Holy Spirit, will you help us please to live our lives for the glory of God. Father, those Christians who know you and love you, who seek to walk in your will and in your ways, may you empower us all, Lord, please, by your Spirit, to serve you, to honour you, to glorify you, to see Jesus lifted high. For others, Lord God, who are here or watching him, who are not yet Christian, who are not yet followers of Jesus, who have not been converted by the Holy Spirit, who have not been made disciples, we pray for them today that in your grace and mercy you would show them the precarious situation that they are in, the very wrath of God abides upon them. And may you show them Jesus, the wonderful Saviour, and may they come to Jesus, drawn by your spirit to him, that they might find life in his name, life forevermore. May you give us all, by the power of your spirit, a new will to live for your glory and your glory alone.